Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. It may be interesting to you. It might not be interesting to you. But it might be to know where the inspiration from these messages that I come up with comes from. Sometimes it's a real struggle. Sometimes it pours out like water. Always the Holy Spirit guiding me, leading me, revealing things to me in one way or another. Very often it starts with the scriptures that speak to me in unique ways. Sometimes other authors or preachers will give me a thought or an idea and I can unpack that and dismantle it and put it back together in my own kind of way. On occasion, there are circumstances that I want to address. Today, for today's message, the inspiration started with a single word, one word, and you can see it in the sermon title. Sunday last week, I was wrestling with technology. I was uh, trying to upload, yes, last week's sermon to social media, and I was frustrated, and it wasn't working the way it was supposed to be. And I was here until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I was not happy. And I was thinking about the political unrest and the social unrest and the protests that have been going on since the death of that gentleman, George Floyd, while he was in police custody. And all the frustration that comes on every side that. And I am tired of coronavirus, and I want our church to be able to things to do the things that we want to do without limitations or restrictions. And this whole variety of tension was working on me. And as I was finally driving home, in this weird state of mind, the Spirit gave me a word, harsh. Harsh. The world we live in is harsh. And it will treat us harshly. And it stuck with me. And it rolled around in my brain. And I got home and my wife and I went out on a bike ride on the CNO Canal. And I began to feel a little bit better at least. But the word stayed with me. And on Monday I began to make some notes and study and sermonize. The word harsh comes from Middle English, and it originally referred to the texture of things. And it was, in fact, the first part of it was hairy. Hairy or coarse or rough. Middle English has some Scandinavian roots, and the word harsk in Danish and Norwegian means rotten or rancid, so that might be connected. And as we use the word today, we usually use the word harsh to describe personal interaction, the harsh words that we throw at one another, the rotten treatment that the world inflicts, the coarse and rough circumstances that we endure. It's a harsh world, my friends, and it happens over and over and over and over, and we know that. My question for the day, as we deal with the harshness, which we do, how do we prevent that harshness from sticking to us and becoming harsh ourselves? How do we deal with the harshness and the difficulty and yet still be people of love and grace and mercy and hope? And that's a challenge. There is a horrible and disgusting thing that still continues to happen in this country, and it is the sport of dog fighting. And the dogs that they train for that mess, in order to bring out the aggression in them, they get treated very cruelly. They get beaten, starved, aggravated. All sorts of terrible things to provoke them to attack. It's brutal. Now, of course, we are much more 
complex than dogs. We have reason and emotion and intellect and all sorts of things that animals don't have, but the principle remains. And as the world treats us harshly, as we get beat up and beat down by the world, doesn't it seem those who have had the most harsh treatment are awful quick to lash out in return, are awful quick to inflict damage on others? There's an old saying in the circles of psychotherapy, hurt people hurt people. People that have been injured, emotionally damaged in the soul, they are much more prone to cause damage in relationships with others. And as the tension and the pain and the wounds build up and up and up, unless we learn to cope and deal with those things in the good and healthy ways, they will come out in all the wrong ways. How do we overcome, my friends? We're going to start this morning in Isaiah chapter 53. And these are familiar verses, the prophecy of the crucifixion. And what I want us to focus on is the harshness of the treatment that they laid upon Jesus and his response in return. Let's stand together to the honor the reading of God's word. Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Almighty God, O Father of heaven, enlighten us this day. Help us to be a bit more Christ-like as the world lays their hurt upon us, that we would endure, that we would overcome, and that you, God, would be magnified through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. The supreme example of unfair. The pinnacle of human cruelty. The worst of our humanity revealed at the crucifixion. Harsh is too small a word. They put him on trial. Unfairly accused. Slapped him. Spit upon him. They dressed him up in a fancy robe and put a crown of thorns upon his head and mocked him and cursed him. And they ordered him scourged, which means they laid a whip across his back about 40 times. And the cords of the whip would have little shards of bone or metal in them and it would rip the flesh wide open. And they made him carry the cross to Golgotha's hill where they drove the spikes through his wrist and through his feet. And they hung him there to die. Yet he opened not his mouth. He did not retaliate hate for hate. He did not accuse and curse and counterattack. He did not call down the legions of angels that surely would have come at his word. In fact, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When we endure the harshness and the unfair and the unkind and the mean spirit of the world, Isn't it the natural inclination of humankind to retaliate, to respond, to get back, give them double what they done me? And I'm sure that all of us have experienced that in one way or another. And yet we have this example of the Lord 
and we have the words of Scripture, Matthew 5, turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Give them your coat and your shirt too. And love your enemy even while they are doing you so wrong. (laughs) It's an easy thing to say, well, friends, just be more like Jesus. Well, the Bible says, but oh, it is so hard to do, isn't it? We have this thing in us that wants to rear its ugly head and strike back and lash out and I'll show them who they're messing with. On Sunday last, when I was having such difficulty with the computer, I was about ready to take a hammer and smash it into a thousand pieces. And I have a hammer in my office. When I get the criticisms or the harsh words from people, which sometimes happens, you know, I can usually force a smile on the outside and hold my tongue. But there's a bit of rage that runs underneath that. And you all know that, because you've seen that rage leak out of me. That's okay. I've seen the rage leak out of you sometimes, too. So let's think about a few things we can learn today to help us do better, to be able to love the enemy in the midst of his attack, to not respond with more hurt and hate, but to overcome the harshness through love grace and mercy. And our first learning point is this, my friends. Do not let your emotions control your actions. Do not let your emotions, especially those negative or difficult emotions, control your actions. We are emotional beings, no doubt. We are made that way. Our emotions are good things to have. We are made to feel. That's why they call them feelings. But if we fail to control our emotions, our emotions will end up controlling us. And we see the injustice of the world, and we experience the hurt and the harshness that they want to offer us. Of course we feel the sting. And I do not deny that it is a painful experience. We know that. And we have that anger, or that frustration, or that urge to respond with more anger and frustration to do others the way they done me. That is not the way. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us a good word, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. That first bit, be angry and do not sin, says it is perfectly reasonable to experience the emotion of anger. But it is not acceptable to let that drive your behavior or your actions. Because when we do, the only thing that comes out of it is destruction and more hurt. You've seen the wave of protests and the looting that has gone on over the past couple of weeks in our country. And I get that there is anger and frustration and the trend of violence inflicted upon people of color at the hands of our law enforcement, something is definitely wrong. Something is out of whack because it continues to happen time and time again. And it is right to speak up and we should protest. But burning a department store in Los Angeles because of something that happened in Minneapolis, that's not protesting. That's burning an apartment store. It's looting and it's a crime. And it's just as wrong as the man dying unjustly in the first place. And two wrongs don't make it right. But when anger drives action, that's what you get. And it gives place for the enemy to take control of our behavior and leads to all sorts of more destructiveness. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred will always stir up more strife. It is love and mercy and grace that covers all the sin. When those negative emotions of anger, hatred, spite, 
retaliation, it just amplifies. And it just grows and it adds fuel to the fire. And the only way to generate peace is through grace. That's all there is. Secondly, we need to always remember and always recognize that people are broken. People are broken. People are crazy. People are burdened, wounded, carrying all the baggage of their lives and all the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and no one is immune to it, you and I included except for Jesus himself. You know the scriptures all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, we like sheep, have turned astray. There's none that are righteous, no, not one. There is a thing that I've been studying recently, and it's a, it's a psychological theory, and yes, it is perfectly compatible with scripture. It's called family systems theory. And the gist of it is that every person... All of us have learned over the years from our family system, mostly mom and dad and brother and sister and grandma, how to act and how to behave. And we carry those things all of our lives. And also from our circumstances, from our jobs, from our faith. And none of those systems are perfect either. And others, there's dysfunction everywhere we go. And then we combine that with the uniqueness of every individual. So, you and your parents and their parents before them, they were somewhat flawed in their own way. Churches are flawed. People at school and jobs and all that. So there's, there's broken, flawed people all around. Teaching us in broken and flawed ways. And we too are somewhat imperfect. So is it any wonder that we sometimes behave in bizarre and strange ways? As we begin to understand that, we can dissect it and learn to get a little bit better. Like I said about the dogs that get treated badly and they become aggressive, same sort of thing. If we remember that people are broken, when that person, that circumstance, that unfair comes your way, your response can be one of two things. Okay? You can take it personally and you can get mad back at them and you can launch your counterattack and spin it all up. Or you can recognize and remember people are broken, people are flawed, living out their own family systems, and the only thing that can truly heal is mercy and grace and love. We of all people should know that the only thing that can truly heal is mercy and grace and love, right? And hasn't that mercy and grace come your way and brought some healing into your life? Well, in those difficult circumstances, you, my friends, have the ability and the opportunity to demonstrate exactly what Jesus is about. Grace and mercy grounded in love. You can be the one who shows a broken person who Jesus is. Indeed, in action, in forgiveness, not just words, not just come to church with us. Restoration. Knowing that people are broken, universally, starting with you and I, is the beginning of seeing the way people God sees people. Seeing people the way God sees people. And we get the divine perspective on humanity. It starts to live with compassion for the broken. Rather than just being mad at them because they're not as perfect as you think they should be. And that's the point in Jesus' words from Matthew 5 about turn the other cheek and go the second mile. The hurt and pain that we inflict on one another, it's got to stop somewhere. And Jesus says it's got to stop with you. Let it stop with you. We cannot continue to escalate and retaliate and give them back. It's got to stop. God says it stops here. And if that requires you to take a couple of shots and suck it up for a little bit, so be it. 
He gave us the example of take the shots and suck it up without retaliating when the whole world laid its sin across his shoulders. And as the Lord endured the affair, the suffering, the cruelty, the harshness of it all, so can you, because his spirit is in you and his strength is in you. Now, if you're going to be the kind of person that can do that, and I'm getting to my third point, if you're going to be the kind of person that God, God calls you to be, to endure suffering and hardship without retaliation, without breaking, that requires a supernatural strength in you. That requires you to be exceptionally strong in the soul. And you have got to be whole in Christ. And you have got to find your strength and your peace in him and not try to find yourself or your strength or your well-being in the eyes of the world. So third, know that you are complete in Christ. Colossians 2, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him, the head of all principality and power. And Paul talked about surrendering his life, recognizing that he was crucified with Christ, and it is Christ who lives in him to strengthen him, to give him identity, to give him well-being, to give him peace. All those things have got to come from God rather than from the world. That we would know who we are in Christ. And that gives us the ability to endure, that gives us the ability to receive without retaliating. It overwhelms our sin nature and our own brokenness, and we are able to show hope when everything seems hopeless. It's the value system of the world that's twisted and corrupt. You try to find yourself in the ways of the world, and you try to make your place and show the world how great you are, the method is, stand your ground. Don't let them push you around. Let them know who's the boss. Defend your turf and justify yourself. The way of Jesus is, surrender it all. Give away all the world. Find your value in God. I'm going to wrap it up with the story of the lifeboat game. You ever play the lifeboat game when you were a kid? It's the way of the world. You're at sea with seven people, and the ship is sinking. And there's only room in the lifeboat for six. Somebody's going down with the ship. And the lifeboat game is everybody's got to prove how great they are and how valuable they are. I am the pastor of the church. My people need my wisdom and leadership. As if. I'm a politician. Congress can't do without me. We have important legislation that needs to be addressed. I'm a beauty queen and a movie star, and the world loves me the most. I should go in the lifeboat. And that's what people do. Prove their worth. How would Jesus respond in the lifeboat game? Y'all go ahead. I would gladly die in your place. And he can only do that because he knew who he was in his father. And he was perfectly content with his identity found in God. And he didn't need to prove himself. And he didn't need to show off how great he was or stronger or smarter or better. He was already complete in his father, and that was enough for him. Is it enough for you? Friends, the world is a harsh place. It will beat you down. Beware. Do not let the harshness and the cruelty of the world become you. Don't let your emotions control you. Rather, let the Spirit of God and the Spirit of grace control you. Everyone is broken, us included. 
Don't be surprised when they do broken things in the world. And our calling and our role and our God-given responsibility is to show mercy and grace, to see as God sees and bring hope and restoration. And third, know that you are complete in Christ. Find yourself, your identity, your wholeness in him, and his spirit is in you. It gives you the ability to have a life of surrender rather than try to dominate. And the paradox of it all is that in surrender, that's where true strength is always found. Amen? Father God, we rejoice in you and we thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love, your goodness, your grace. Thank you for the strength you pour out to us. Thank you, Father, for giving us the ability to see the world the way you see the world. And Lord, that we would live up to our calling as your people. I pray your blessings upon us, that we would be instruments of your grace. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, as we close today, we have a hymn of invitation for you. And I invite you to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I invite you to submit your whole self before him. I invite you to lay your burdens down at the foot of the cross. Whatever is on your heart this morning, I'm happy to pray with you about that. I most especially encourage you to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Live forever in him. If you have a burden, you come now. Let's stand together. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.